Welcome, everyone, uh, to the Kroc School of Peace Studies at the University of San Diego uh, for our first distinguished lecture series event uh, of the school year and my, my first ever distinguished lecture series event. Um, I joined the, the Kroc School family as executive director of the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice just in July. Um, so I'm already starting to see some familiar faces, but I really look forward to, to getting to know many more of you in, in the months and years uh, that come. Uh, before I, I get started, I did want to welcome some uh, important guests we have with us today uh, at the event. Uh, Bishop Soro and Bishop Warduni of the Cald uh, Chaldean Church here in San Diego, as well as many other leaders from the Chaldean community right here in San Diego. Uh, we have Senator Joel Anderson of California's 38th District, also right here in San Diego. Uh, the Provost of University of San Diego, Andrew Allen, and the Dean uh, of the Croc School, Patric Patricia Marquez, are joining us today. My parents are here as well. That, that may not be important to you, but it's, it's important to me. Never miss a chance to thank your parents. Um, the Distinguished Lecture Series here at the Croc School, it's been going on for over 12 years, over 40 speakers. Um, one of the missions Mrs. Croc gave us uh, was to be sure to engage with the community and let the community engage with peacemakers from around the world. Uh, so we can all better understand what it takes to end violence and, and build peace. And the lecture series is, is really one of the key ways we do that. And tonight we are, are truly pleased to be able to welcome the Archbishop of Erbil, Archbishop Bashar Mahdi Warda. The Archbishop joins us from the city of Erbil, and just last year I was privileged to be able to visit Erbil, although I didn't know the Archbishop at, at the time. And, just to set a little bit of the context, Erbil might upend some of the expectations you have if, if we th when we think about uh, Iraq. It's a, it's a beautiful city. It's a flourishing city. Uh, it's known for perhaps having one of the most delicious fish dishes in the world. So if you visit, please, please try the fish. But as you're driving around Erbil, you see reminders of, of how close uh, the violence is. I remember driving and seeing a, a road sign that said Mosul 100 kilometers that way. So you get these reminders that, that it's different very close by. And that's, that's the city that the Archbishop is joining us from, a flourishing city on the edge uh, of a pretty brutal, uh, brutal conflict. Some of you might know the book uh, that John Paul Lederach wrote called Moral Imagination. It's, it's a core text in the peace building field. And the, the question that, that John Paul Lederach poses at the beginning of that book, which is really the core question of the peace building field is, how do we transcend cycles of violence? Uh, and the, so the Archbishop tonight is going to be speaking directly to the core mission of the Institute for Peace and Justice. How do we end the cycles of violence we see in Iraq and, and elsewhere in the Middle East? And, and so what, better, what better speaker to, to talk to us about that? The Archbishop is an accomplished educator, author of several books. Um, he also started several schools in Baghdad and is one of the founders of the Catholic University of Erbil. We're here at a Catholic university, so it's an opportunity for us to reflect on what our mission and purpose is as a Catholic university. The Archbishop was elected uh, to, the, to be an Archbishop in 2009 and consecrated with the consent of Pope Benedict in 2010. In addition to his pastoral duties, since the evasion of Mosul and Nineveh by ISIS in 2014, he has led humanitarian efforts for tens, tens of thousands of individuals and families. And, and those needs are only going to grow whatever the outcome uh, of the fighting in Mosul right now. And as ISIS has spread in Iraq and threatened the Christian community in Iraq, He's become a global spokesman for that Christian community and, and a powerful voice for peace and justice for all of Iraq, for all of the people in Iraq. 
We are so fortunate to be able to hear from him tonight, so please join me in welcoming Archbishop Mashar Monty Warder. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, guests, scholars, your excellencies, and friends. I am truly honored and grateful to speak before you this evening, and I wish to extend my thanks to the University of San Diego, to the Croc Center, the Diocese of San Diego, and the Chaldean Diocese of St. Peter, and all of those who have made it this evening possible. On behalf of the persecuted Christians of Iraq who received our Christianity in the first century, who pos who, whose people still celebrate Mass in the ancient language of Christ, I bring you our greetings and our prayers that from your important positions of academic freedom and moral inquiry, you may continue to think of us as a human beings first children of God, deserving our fundamental human dignity and right as much as any other people. It's my hope that through this visit, we will lay the foundation for further dialogue and cooperation between the University of San Diego and our recently opened Catholic University in Erbil. We are perhaps at a point of unique collaboration the important study and deep analysis which you are engaged in here finds its practical applications in our war torn corner of the world. In a very real sense, the world in which we Christians of Iraq live is a ground zero for the complex problems which you seek here to resolve. I pray that my words tonight will help you to understand our situation more clearly and thus assist you on your own difficult paths, which in, in the end are not separated from us. As noted by His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI in Caritas in Veritate, justice and the common good are for special relevance to the commitment of, to development in an increasingly globalized society. That I am standing before you here this evening is an indication as to not only how globalized our world has become, but how important our collective interest in the, in, is in justice and in the common good. San Diego itself is filled with the diaspora of our people, which I greet them specially tonight, and graduate from your university were critical in making the connection with our university and our remaining people in Iraq. In speaking to you this evening, I will do my best to explain to you the truth of the cycle of violence in the Middle East as I understand it. I will then provide you with my, with my views on the practical roles for Christians and Christianity in ending the cycle of violence. But I do not want, wish, want or wish to mislead you. The cycle of violence in Middle East are centuries in making and will be many generations in ending. Indeed, many of the elements of this violence are seemingly interactable but I stand before you as a Christian first, and we are people of hope and faith and a belief in the good that will come. So let's begin. Violence in Middle East. Violence is as old as man. It started with Adam blaming Eve for disobedience against God. It continued with Abel, murder, and Cain wandering restlessly on the earth. It continued to this day. Although I cannot go more fully into the historical details of violence in this discussion, it is important to understand that this violence has always been with us in Middle East 
and throughout the world. This evening, I'll keep myself to the cycle of violence in the modern history of Middle East, so that we may be able to suggest a roadmap after this crisis through an effective contribution of Christian people and culture. This roadmap enlarges the cycle of Christian participation to include the faithful outside Middle East. Out of my belief that our Lord Jesus Christ is the answer which provides God's healing touch to our wounds. And he, he and his followers can make a difference regardless of where they are, remembering always it is Christ who taught us, blessed are the peacemakers, they, for they shall be called the children of God. This vision, which I will put forward, is also based on the importance of the interreligious dimension of our Christian belief, a dimension which calls upon us to promote peace wherever there are disputes and wars, especially in those Middle Eastern lands that suffers from the seven political and social sins that Mahatma Gandhi referred to. Policy without principles, wealth without work, enjoyment without conscience, wisdom without character, trade without morals, knowledge without a human dimension, and worship without sacrifice, all of which fuel the vortex of violence in all of its forms. The cycle of violence in the 20th century in Middle East, historical background. Historically, there are two forms of violence that have imposed themselves across the Middle East. First, nation-building violence, and second, is religion-motivated violence. The first one, nation-building violence, this form of violence began in the 19th century with the attempt by the Ottoman Empire to restore its control in the Middle East and stop the European advance on the territories of its empire. This efforts included dismantling the traditional decentralized Ottoman regimes in return to the establishment of a centralized states with its own provinces, wilaya, drawing on Islam as a necessity to maintain the unity of the state. This centralized Ottoman state thus came to have its own military and economic institutions and started to draft in men to form the nation's army. This growth in a centralized military power led to atmosphere of distrust and resentment among peace, peacemen and tribal Bedouins. Over time, armed tribal gangs rose up against the Ottoman Empire. These armed gangs were in turn used by the European states to strike at the Ottoman Empire, including Christian administrations living with the territories of the empire. These minorities, administrative forms in the Middle East, had historically provided a form of autonomy, Milla, for Christians in return for loyalty to the state. But when the state started to rely on Islam, in contradiction to its prior position, attempting to provide justice for all its citizens, the concept of citizenships became unattainable for Christians. In this environment, two massacres occurred in 1895-1896, followed by the massacre of 1905 and 1908. These successive massacres made clear the failure of the politics of the Ottoman state and forced Christians to leave many of their former territories. The condition of the Persian state was similar in many respects to that of the Ottoman Empire, 
to witness disorder when it has imposed taxes on its citizens and committed massacres against the Baha'is and Jews in 1902 and in 1903. The religious leaders spoke out loudly at that time, rejecting the totalitarian authority of the state and considered it a form of paganism, but the state suppressed these vows and killed many of its opponents. After the end of World War I, despite the victory of the Allied forces and their many promises, there was no improvement in the overall condition of the people in Middle East. And instead, a commercial bourgeoisie class came to power, which ignored the tribal Bedouin and religious reality of the people. This led to antipathy towards a new administrative power. Out of this, in 1930s, witnessed the raise up of a pan Arab nationalism whose foundations were consolidated by both Christians and Muslims in Egypt, Iraq, and Syria. This pan-Arab nationalism also supported the use of military power to impose its ideology. The second form of violence is religion-motivated violence. Alongside the pan-Arab nationalist trend there also emerged a radical religious movement advocating Islam as the solution that would keep the Arab people safe from what it was supported belief, supporters believe was the oppression of capitalism and communism. This movement set off with global orientation using military setback that befall the Arabs in 1948 and the loss of the Palestinian lands as justification for its positions. It dominated the scene through the leading religious character like Sayyid Qutb, the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. This religious movement demanded that the Arab political entities, which they believe are the treacherous and traitors, be held accountable. This accountability reached the level of demanding a purifying of the nation with all the connections of violence that the phrase carries. From this storm of religious violence emerged against the ruling non-religious entities, elites, thus plunging the Middle East into a new period of interior struggle, assassination, military uprising, all of which left behind wounds that would prove impossible to heal in a large tribal Bedouin society. The coming of Al Khomeini in the late 70s ushered in a new phrase of religiously motivated violence in Middle East. This violence manifested itself in the Shia expansion in the area plunging Iran into war with Iraq and in Afghanistan and in Lebanon. Out of this upheaval, characteristic, charismatic characteristics appeared like Osama bin Laden. Together, these developments mark the beginning of the end of the Arab, pan-Arab nationalism, which saw its complete collapse with the fall of the Ba'ath regime in Iraq and the in entrance <laughs> of the Islamic oppositions into a bloody struggle with the ruling secular power which were seen as corrupt and serving the Western Crusade countries. Drawing from the teaching of Sayyid Qutb, Abu Al Maududi, Bin Laden also held of the view that there was no other choice for Muslims than jihad as the defensive duty. This political Islam also rejected any other political movement, setting itself as the only solution to all this crisis befalling the Islamic nation, a solution that would be good for all times and all places, a solution which provided, in their eyes, knowledge of all aspects of life, 
It condemned any deviation form of rules and norms and expressed readiness to impose their doctrine on others by force. As a consequence of these cultural, religious, social, and political forces, there emerged a global Islamic jihadist movement, the most violent and well-organized kind found expression in the Islamic State in Iraq and Al-Sham ISIS. Before the battles which are now raging across Iraq and Syria, ISIS controlled vast geographic area and today has, his, has followers all over the world, putting it in a position to declare itself a caliphate state, the dream of a similar thinking Muslims throughout the world. ISIS, however, should not be viewed as a new creation in the course of Islamic violence throughout history. Rather, it is in reality a return to the prototype picture of a form of Islam that emerged in the Arabian desert in the 7th century and expanded thereafter through invasion that were based on sacred jihad, intended on to destroy in destroying all the standing civilization at that time. Citing sources from Quran, verses and prophetic saying which they claim they are the basis for this sacred violence, these believers are firm in their justifications of violence toward both non-Muslims and Muslims who neglect the requirements of Islam as viewed by them. What about the violence in the present time? Having discussed the historical origins of violence now be, being forced in the Middle East, we must now address the present situation before moving on to the meaningful ways in, in to ending this violence and the practical roles in which Christians can play part of it. There are numerous and interrelated reasons behind continuation of violence in the Middle East. The common thread which exists is an aim to realize narrow political economic interest for which armed militia, control media and propaganda, suspensions of law and the compensation of freedoms and the harassment of the opponents all combine to affect violence upon society as a whole. This violence duplicate and gain momentum when politicians use religion and rely on sacred text to justify their policies. In this way, violence become a sacred national and religious duty. In the resulting totalitarian regimes, we find unjust deviation of wealth, failure to adopt modern and successful policies to help boost local, local economies, failure to provide job opportunities, and entreated poverty of a vast social sector. This has far-reaching impact on creating individuals and social classes that believe in violence as means of sol solving their problems. Such atmosphere creates situations that support and embrace violence among the unemployment young people who their minds ruined by radical ideologies vent their anger on society through violence. Pope John XXIII warned of this when he wrote in Mother and Teacher, in some of these lands, the enormous wealth the unbridled luxury and the, of the privileged few stands in violence, offensive, contrast to utter poverty of the vast majority. In some part of the world, men are being subjected to inhuman provision so that the output of the national economy can be increased at a rate of acceleration beyond what would be possible if regard were held to social justice and equity. And in other countries, a notable percentage of income 
is absorbed in building up an ill-conceived national prestige and vast sum are spent on armaments. We must be able, we must also be taking into account is that the fact many of the Arab Islamic society are made up of a tribal Bedouin communities that do not readily believe in the concept of state, its law and institutions. And instead, these society rely fundamentally on the authority of the tribe and its Bedouin norms. These Bedouin norms are often subject to mentality of the survival of the strongest. Moreover, the state themselves often encourage tribal conduct in order to realize narrow political ends. Consequently, the logic of jungle law prevails. The civil law exists as a window dressing only useful for appearance sake with international organization while continuing to inflict violence and suspicion of opponents within. The inclination of rage and violent is a reflex on these dare living conditions in Arab and Islamic countries. This accompanied by a collapse of academic institutions and study curriculum wherein the objective of learning are reduced to dictation, memorization and repetition. This result in population where are without creative, intellectual and fully reasoning minds. These educational systems destroy the free expression of viewpoints and encourage inclinations toward violence. Critical thinking skills which would allow for rational and pragmatic solutions to many problems are never taught or learned. The particular vulnerability of the youth in this environment cannot be denied. Their psychological and, psycho, uh, and physical makeup renders them more sensitive to social and economic problems and more prone to violent reaction. Hence, their political conduct is marked by imagination and idealism and the rejection of reality and efforts to change it. What would be the proper role of the Christians in such environment? What would be remain as a proper role for the Christians in ending the cycle of violence, hatred and never ending retribution? First and foremost, we must continue to be who we are a people of forgiveness, love and reconciliation. All of which we draw from Christ, from being his followers. Alone amidst the millstone of violence, it is we Christian walking together with Christ who can provide this example. If this not our fundamental purpose, then our true value has certainly been lost. In the Gospel of Matthew, our Lord taught us, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make, make it a salty again? It will be thrown out and be trampled underfoot and worthless. If we are to avoid becoming worthless, as peace builders, we Christians need a clear indication from the international community that it's, this, is in, this, this is our role in violence. Pope John the 23rd warned, also wrote about this in many aspects, which we, of course, we cannot go in these details. I have to skip in, in this sense. I know the limit of time. So, in, this, in discussing this topic, I must speak for a moment to the real and ongoing opposition to faith in the world of institutional, international aid and peace building. 
It is a tremendous flow of international efforts that in seeking to be blind in term of favoring one faith over the another, they almost make themselves blind to the proper role that must be assigned to faiths in addressing the realities of Middle East. This is particularly so as it applies to Christians. If there is ever to be peace in Middle East, then there must be growth in the culture of forgiveness. If there is to be growth in the culture of forgiveness, there must be an example of that forgiveness in action. And where there is an example of this forgiveness in action, it must be supported and protected by international community. To ignore this and to refuse to affirmatively support Christians and their unique as a role as Christians is not simply negligent, but, but in a real sense, borders on complexity and the continuation of this tragedy. I realize these are hard words, but to continue cycle of violence and injustice in Middle East does not occur completely in a vacuum of its own making. Billions of dollars are spent on so-called aid, yet implementation of this aid is left to organizations and mindset which under the guise of so-called enlightened impartiality are too often ignorant or hostile in practice to anything that touches upon faith. Regrettably, we found this to be particularly when it applies to we Christians. How often we hear that our faith is part of the problem and therefore not available to be part of the solution. And friends, we do not hear this from those who have come to persecute us. We hear it from educated people from abroad who say they, are, they have come to save us. What are we, the lasting remaining Christians of Iraq, the real live victims of these decades of misguided policies so often implemented with the collusion of the educated and enlightened West? What are we to do with this? Tragedy brings clarity. And the tragedy of our genocide has brought us clear clarity in the form of the core importance of our faith. In the end, we have not survived in Iraq to this day through the assistance of established international aid, through the support of Western governments, or through the efforts of United Nations and the like. In fact, we received barely any assistance at all from any of these in our time of a truly existential needs. Instead, the funding and support that have saved us have come almost exclusively from private faith-based aid dollars, like churches, uh, in the United States, in Europe, the Chaldean community in San Diego, the Chaldean community in Detroit, uh, Knights of Columbus, Aid to the Church in Need, so Macaritas, so many of these church organizations who were, were there from the first day of the persecution. This sharing of faith has brought us into solidarity with others all around the world and giving us a strength from outside to support our own existing strength of faith, which we hold so deeply inside. But it's our faith that sustained us. This is much clear. And it's our faith which tell us we have a role still to play amidst all of this violence as a people of love and forgiveness. But friends, we are now down to barely 300,000 Christians in Iraq. If we, are, if we are to have a role to play, we need support and more importantly, an open and public recognition of the legitimacy 
of our role as peacemakers. Any meaningful support must be acknowledged the centrality of our Christian faith in who we are and what we do. And any governmental or institutional aid assistance which ignores or denies this fundamental truth essentially denies us as people and rejected us for who we are. I quote here from the words from Pope Benedict the 16 in Caritas in Veritate, even peace can run the risk of being considered as a technical product merely to the outcome of agreements between governments or initiatives aimed at ensuring effective economic aid. It is true that peace building requires constant interplay of diplomatic contact. Nevertheless, if such efforts are to have lasting effects, they must be based on, va on values rooted in the truth of the human life. That is, the voice of the people affected must be heard and their situation must be taken into consideration if their expectations are to be correctly interpreted. Returning then to our role as a Christians, how does our commitment to forgiveness, love and reconciliation play out in a practical term? Pope Francis himself reminds us of our special role in Evangelii Gaudium, where he writes, our world is being torn apart by wars and violence. In various countries, conflicts and all divisions of the past are re-emerging. I especially ask Christians in communities throughout the world to offer a rounded and attractive witness of a fraternal communion. Let everyone admire how you care for one another and how you encourage and accompany one another. In our Christian community in Iraq, we can follow the word of Pope Francis through our efforts in two fundamental areas critical in a caring and functioning society, education and health care. Education. The long-standing history of Catholic education throughout the world is one of that based on tolerance and critical inquiry grounded by faith in God and a commitment to serve the humankind. This tradition has made Catholic higher education valued not just among Christians but among all people of the Middle East and elsewhere. It is no accident that many of the most important Muslim leaders in the Middle East send their children to Catholic universities in the West. In this, there is, there is a vital role for the Christians of Iraq through the establishment of our Catholic university in Erbil and in many other primary and secondary schools around the country, all of which are open to children, children and stu students of all faiths we can give others the chance to breathe Christ and the tolerance of Christianity by showing our belief in the importance of critical and open inquiry. We can begin to break down the walls of intolerance and rigid thinking which so bludges our country and the greater Middle East. Through our living example of tolerance, we are also able to be respectful of others' faith and cultures and help their student develop thinking mindset and give them space to identity, to identify the good in their own culture and to consider improvement in the context still respects their ancient heritage. We Christian, especially together with our brothers and sisters and the worldwide community of the Catholic University are uniquely positioned to fulfill this critical role. The second area is healthcare. A second role in which Christians can play a major part is the 
in the demonstration of our respect for life as shown through providing medical and health care. As with education, there is a long history in Iraq and in Middle East of Christians as, as provides of quality medical, medical care in a region where respect for life has been so often a victim of senseless violence, we Christian can show another way, a way that values all lives, that shows compassion to the sick and injured regardless of faith or ethnicity. This provision of medical service is closely related to educational efforts. It's our hope that we may soon open a, technical, uh, a teaching hospital, which will also be open to all. And this way we continue to show a path to mercy and healing which benefits all. In this area, Christian can play a pioneering role in assisting Muslims to find a way out of their present crisis and to get rid of the vortex of violence in which they have been trapped, whether willingly or unwillingly. In closing, we must be truthful about the future of Iraq and the Christians' people there. We cannot pretend that any of these difficult problems would be resolved any time soon, and certainly not by Christians alone. Yet, in these coming difficult years, we can continue to provide example of Christian thought, action, love, and forgiveness. We cannot continue to live in faith. We, we can continue to live in faith and hope that someday, perhaps many years from now, these efforts that are making now may show some fruit. For, the, for us, this is not a choice. It is what we believe we are called to do. Having survived this evil that sought to hurt and to destroy us, we are now walk, walking with God in the footsteps of Christ, and we are not to be deterred. In the words of the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I thank you all. Please pray for us and be assured that likewise we will pray for you. Thank you. I'm going to use the, the moderator's privilege and, and start with a question. Um, one of the things I find so fascinating about your work is there's these really urgent, immediate needs of your community, uh, of the IDPs that have come north, the uh, internally displaced people or refugees. And yet you're also thinking long term. You're building institutions. You're building hospitals and universities. Talk about your decision making and how you balance these short term urgent needs with these longer term efforts. Well, um, first responding to the immediate needs, uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is a, this is a call. I mean, uh, people, when they walk to your church uh, seeking refuge with nothing, uh, as they came on the 9th of uh, 7th uh, of August, uh, 2014, so we had to do something. Uh, with the very limited things that we have and sources. And by the time when people start, uh, I mean, coming and visiting bishops, priests, organizations, they started also, I mean, they ask about the needs, which we, which we know obviously is shelter, education, health care. Uh, these are the and food, of course. Uh, and the first, I mean, weeks, it was difficult. I mean, uh, we bishops, we were, uh, I mean, uh, there was a committee formed by bishops. Uh, three of them were uh, also IDPs from Mosul. Uh, and being there as a hosting bishop, uh, Bishop Nona uh, was the man in charge. We were able to always just listen to the needs and also report this. 
And as I told you, so many communities, church communities really responded to, to that. But as you know, I know that it's not enough. It's not enough to have a house and to eat and to drink. Uh, those people are, are desperate. Those people are dead. And um, that's why we say genocide, because they've lost everything. And their face, you could see that there was a dead person there. So you have to think again uh, how you really make rebirth of this community and uh, definitely it's a providence of God that he showed us so many wonderful people that uh, we had ideas I mean we need education and uh, there was a need of for uh, schools and the schools were there but on the long term uh, I would say this is uh, also uh, a cultural and religious problem and it should be addressed in a dialogue of life. Yes, conferences of interreligious dialogue is important, but we need more than, I mean, conferences. We need a dialogue of life. Our ancestors, uh, during the time of Abbasiyin, they were very clever in finding a way of dealing with Bedouins who came from the, from the Arab Peninsula. And they've started, they use their skills in translating the philosophical text from Greek to Arabic. And they taught, they, they made philosophy available for the Arabs and they established the, the house of wisdom. And that was in the ninth century. So in the ninth century, our ancestors did this. Of course, we have to do it. And we have also, uh, speaking of not just Middle East, but in Iraq particularly, we have a very successful experience of the Jesuit fathers who established also a college in Baghdad and a uh, university in Baghdad. We have a very successful schools by the sisters, Dominican sisters, Chaldean sisters. So all of these examples were there and people were appreciating. And we have this gift that they trust us. They trust our schools. And when we have this gift, we have to use it. You cannot just say, well, I am being blessed that they trust me. Uh, so you have to do something with this. And I think uh, we were able in, 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 in establishing the uni Catholic University in Erbil, which is the first university ever in an Islamic world. I mean, we have... Uh, the Holy Spirit University in Lebanon. We have Al Hikma University in Lebanon, Al Batra University, Beit Laham. All of these are Catholic universities, but none of them have this title uh, as a licensed Catholic university uh, as such. Thank God we were blessed to have this. Um, I, back again, it's, it's a work of the whole church. It's the work of the whole church that made it possible for us really to care for the IDPs uh, that we have. And with, believe me, without the help uh, of the churches and the Christians, we were not able today to celebrate the possible returning. I mean, today people, they are celebrating in, in Erbil and in Duhok, praying, uh, praising, and some of them went already to, to, to these liberated villages. This celebration is possible because of the help. And to tell you, your help have made it possible. Your help made the difference. Um, there's a question here that is, is similar to one I was going to ask as well. And it, it sort of brings us right to the headlines and, and what's going on in, in Mosul right now. Um, you had uh, criticism of the international community's actions and the international aid. Uh, community as, as we all do. What, what advice might get you give uh, to international organizations, to international agencies, um, assuming that uh, the Iraqi military forces will be successful in Mosul, you know, for what comes next? What advice would you give to, to create a more positive outcome in Mosul? And, and what role might Christians have in that process as well? Uh, I think to work directly with the persecuted uh, people and victims is important. And not to approach them always through this bureaucracy of these institutionals, I mean, uh, 
uh, aid uh, to work with them and be with them closely, it's, it's important. It's important to reject any kind of any plans of retaliation and revenge. Uh, there was a, an idea which we were, it was terrifying one, that there is a, an attempt to empty the Nineveh plain from the uh, Arab uh, villages uh, who stayed there and of course we have a negative experience but we refused. The church leaders refused this, uh, this attempt because this would create a long, uh, in the long term, more crisis. Uh, we've, told, we've told them, leave it to us, we will, we will do our work together. Uh, any kind of demolishing uh, these, these villages, uh, even if some of them looted uh, our Christian villages, any, any, any plan to demolish these villages would be really uh, dangerous for, for, for the, the living in, in the whole Nineveh Plain. So these kind of uh, attempts, uh, I think it, uh, it, it gives an example. Uh, last month, uh, one of the contracts at the Catholic University was given to a Muslim uh, professor from Mosul, uh, a Sunni from Mosul, who is now, of course, in Erbil. But somehow he was a bit surprised that uh, we gave him a contract of, of work. But we've told him, no, this is a Catholic university. You are professional, you are qualified, and you deserve this. And I mean, small stories here and there makes a difference. You know, we have an audience here of, of people who, who do care about these issues. What would you ask of, of people in the United States? Uh, what is the best thing that you know, individuals like us can do to support you? Uh, first and foremost is praying for the persecuted Christians around the world. Uh, the Christians are the most persecuted community in more than 32 countries. And of course, when it comes to Middle East, you have Syria and Iraq. Uh, and of course, being, being a bishop there, I'd ask you to pray for the Christians in, uh, in Iraq in this difficult time. Uh, raising awareness telling the story uh, of the cr persecuted Christians in Iraq, telling the story also about the needs. I think it's time also, uh, without getting so deep in, in the issue, it's time for the Americans to question their foreign policy. I mean... Uh, Please, get deep. Let's go uh, deep. <laughs> your, your decisions is, is, is really affecting people there and there and there. Look to the mess that's, that's being created <coughs> because of these uh, adventures. And, uh, I don't know what, what you, they think, but we don't see a lot of talks about this. And I mean, I know this time your election is a very special uh, election, and uh, I would congratulate you for that. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's time to tell I mean, all, all those people in power Come on, tell us about your foreign policy because there are people are suffering, people are dying because of decisions being made in, 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 in offices uh, for, for reasons which we do not know. I mean, yes, we know there are difficulties, totalitarian regimes, and just we've said we, we, we know that. But I think to have a, a deeper dialogue with the people concerned without coming and telling we have the solutions oh we know what solutions you you've brought so far so i think i think it's time it's time to question uh, and to get deep on on this issue so it's otherwise it would continue it will hopefully end in iraq but it continue somewhere else so praying for the christians and uh, raising awareness about the Christians, questioning the foreign policy, and continuing the aid. I mean, uh, probably some of you have seen all the destruction that happened in the, in the villages, uh, shrines and burned churches, uh, monasteries were, were demolished, uh, lots of houses in Taluskov, Batnaya, Baqofa, Karamlez, Bartalla, Karakosh, 
the, I mean, the destruction is immense. These, I mean, we need help. If you think that the $81 million, which, were, which is assigned by the United uh, States of America to help rebuilding Iraq, I think we are not going to get um, any sure of it because we know where it goes and how it would be spent. So we need you in, in this. And when once we rebuild all of these villages, we, we will continue the celebration. There, I tell you, there is a celebration, yes. The cry is deep because we suffered a lot, but at least people who said, thank God, I mean, the cross is victorious. The evil is, is gone, that's it. But we need your voice. Without you, uh, as we are now, we are very weak. So that's why we say we need your voice.